little bit. Last Saturday, uh, we had Bible study, and on the first Saturday of every month, Tracy leads a Bible study in the fellowship hall, and if you could, it'd be great if you could come to that. It used to be a ladies' Bible study, but then recently we've opened it up. Now it's for everybody, and I know Saturdays are a lot of times busy, but it's a great time for us to come and, and uh, have a, 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 a true good understanding of the Word of God. Well, anyway, last week, <clears throat> you're just going to have to stay with me. Remember what Nancy said, you can't judge the sermon or be mad at the sermon, so you're just going to have to stay with me because I'm going to go all over the place around. And we got some time, so I'm going to take you to a spot, but we're going to take the scenic route getting there, okay? So just bear with me. I told them in the first service it's going to be a train wreck, and you guys are just going to have to put the pieces up and put it on the track and make it work for you, but we'll see what happens. Maybe I can reel it in this service. But anyway... Last week she taught on the Lord's uh, Prayer, and she did a great job of that. Tracy's a very good teacher. Um, Michael, make sure that's in the video when she watches it. She, she really is. She's a good teacher, and it's funny. I'll, I'll, I'll preach in a minute. She's a school psychologist, and the thing about Tracy is uh, the parents love her and the teachers love her because she talks in a way that you can understand. And what she says is, it, you know, you got to put it on a shelf where people can reach it. You know, you can have all these collegiate words and these $10 words and all this stuff, but if people can't understand it, it doesn't do any good. So she's just a very good teacher that way. She, she's just plain and simple, and she's just Appalachian and just country, and she makes it work. So, But anyway, she was teaching on the Lord's Prayer and really focused in at the end of the Lord's Prayer, after the Lord's Prayer, where the Lord talks about unforgiveness. And I'm going to share that with you because it really just set with me and sparked something in me. And that's kind of where this sermon came from. In Matthew chapter 6, beginning of verse 14, and I'm going to be all over the place for a few minutes in your Bible. So if you just want to set them aside and then at the end, jump in with me. So Matthew chapter 6, beginning in verse 14, Jesus says, For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will forgive you also. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses... Neither will your father forgive your trespasses. So we've heard that before. And, and the thing that I want to talk about just for a minute is when we hear those things, and we've all heard those things, and, but the thing that we lose in the Word of God a lot of times, especially today, now stay with me and see if this isn't true. This is not negotiable. This is not a request. This is not if it's easy for you to forgive. It's not if you want to forgive. It's not if it works out for you to forgive. This is if you forgive, then God will forgive. But if you do not forgive, then God will not forgive. See, what we have to understand and what we lose in the Word of God is it's finished. The Word of God says that. There's no if, ands, or buts. Right now, I don't know about you guys, but Tracy and I, we watch a lot of these true crime shows, you know, Dateline and 2020, and that stuff's really fascinating to us, and I'm sure all you guys have seen that, and it always amazes me, right? Like, you'll see somebody, like, this is the far extreme, I understand, but like their whole family has been slaughtered, and they're in court, and they can stand up and say, I forgive you to this person. That's the power of God, amen? That, that's just amazing, but I've also known people Personally, I've known people, and some of you may fall in this category. I've known people that, not in that situation, I've never known anybody in that situation, praise the Lord, but I've known people that have had things happen in their life, and they say, well, the Lord's just going to have to overlook it. I can't forgive them. The Lord's just going to have to understand, because it, it hurt me too bad. I can't forgive them. But the problem is, that's not what the Word of God says. The Word of God says, if we forgive them, God will forgive us. See, we want God's grace to shine in our life, but we don't want to be what? Obedient in His Word. It's not that simple. That's why all these false doctrines are so, so damaging because they teach us if you don't want to forgive, you don't have to forgive. You know? If, if you don't want to live right, you don't have to live right. God's got you covered. He did everything on the cross. That's why these things are so dangerous because if we have an attitude of, well, I'm not going to forgive, and God just has to be okay with it. I'm not too sure that's going to work out too good for us. Because He's God, right? Like, we can't put that on Him. We can't, we can't come to Him with that kind of attitude. But if we're honest, we do. Now watch. Let me ask you something. 
How many of you ever did this? Now, hopefully I'm the only one that's ever did this, but how many of you ever said, I know I shouldn't do that, but? Anybody? Or, I know I should do this, but. And see, it's that but that gets us in trouble. See, we have this attitude towards God, and I've had people actually tell me this out of their own mouth. I'm just going to sin, and God's just going to have to forgive me. Again, I'm not sure that's going to work. Because the Bible says we have to repent of our sins. And repentance means we turn away from it. See, our attitude towards the Word of God has to change. We read these things, we know these things, and we're, but we just sort of brush it off. Amen? We don't take it as serious as we should. Now this I'm going to talk about today is obedience. Obedience to the Word of God. Obedience to the Lord. It's probably, like I said, the most important thing. And, I, and I'm going to show you some things about obedience, and I'm going to show you some things about how we can trans transition from that into our own life. But obedience. The reason why obedience is important today is because it doesn't exist anymore. Amen? I mean, you guys understand, I don't have kids, so I can talk about y'all's, and it's fine. Don't get mad at me. But over and over again, the Bible says that kids are to obey their parents. Why would the Bible say that over and over and over again? Because as we teach our kids not only to obey their parents, we're teaching them to be adults that obey God. There's no obedience anymore. You know why? Because there's no discipline anymore. You can't discipline kids. You can't discipline them in school. You can't discipline them at home. I mean, it's a situation. There's no discipline. Listen, you know what? Something that's missing in this world <clears throat> Church discipline. Let me tell you a story. You guys know I'm in love. My, my main man, Pastor Moses. If you never met him, I'm sorry he passed away uh, last year. He's a pastor from India. Now let me, let me just lay the foundation of what the church should look like through Pastor Moses. Let me tell you a story. Pastor Moses, and if you don't know him, let me tell you for sure he's hands down the most godly anointed man I've ever met in my life when you look at what a disciple should be in the word of God my mind goes to Pastor Moses I'm talking about he, he would message me on Facebook and say I can't tell you where I'm at he's somewhere over in Iraq I can't tell you where I'm at but pray for us ISIS is close I mean this is a, he's laying churches down ISIS he's like they're close but they'll leave us alone because they don't want they don't want nobody else to know where they are but you know, and I'm like, I don't really want to teach Sunday school next Sunday in the air condition. And, you know, so this is my main man. So he tells two stories I'm going to share with you. And I'm just laying a foundation. I'll preach in a minute. But he tells a story of a lady that comes to church one Sunday. And she says, Pastor, I'm sorry I missed church last Sunday. I forgot it was Sunday. Now, in America, we just said, oh, it's fine. But you know what Pastor Moses said? He said, you are the sorriest church member I have. How in the world could you forget about church? The most important thing you'll do all week, you forget about church. Now, what would happen today if Pastor Rogers said that to one of us? He also tells of a story of a man who brought another friend of his to church. Now, this one would get me in trouble. And he comes up to Pastor Moses and he says, Hey, look, Pastor Moses, I brought my coworker to church. And Pastor Moses is like, oh, that's really good. Well, he gets to talking to the guy, and he finds out they've been co-workers for like years, and this guy just now brings him to church. And again, Pastor Moses, you're the sorriest church member I have. You mean to tell me that you've worked with this guy for years, and you're just now bringing him to church, and you think you're doing something good by coming up? Church discipline. There, there, there's something to be said about obedience and about discipline, but the problem is, you can't, we couldn't do that in America. That's what, you know, we laugh about that. And we're like, Moses, man, like you wouldn't have a church in America very long. But you know what he had? He had faithful members that he could do that to because he taught them the true word of God. You know, we think about what does the Bible say? And I, I, I'm going to preach in a minute, I promise. But what does the Bible say? Think about it. If, if we truly, 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 truly believe the word of God, followed the word of God, obeyed the word of God. What does Paul say to do to sinners in the church? You discipline them, right? You go to them once, twice, and then what does he say? <whistles> Out the door. Now, again, all of us might have to leave, but there should be something to be said if our pastor comes to us, but now what we do, we either won't go to this church, we'll go to another church, we say, how dare you? You don't have any right. Thou shalt not judge. But that's what the Word of God says. Now, really and truly, if we're honest, 
We should pray for a pastor. We should pray for people in our life that will help us when we're sinning, when we're falling short, when we're going astray. We should want that shepherd to bring us back, but really we don't, do we? We, we don't want nobody meddling in our business. And that's when, remember, Nancy said, you guys can't be mad at me with my preaching. But that's what we do, if we're honest, right? We should want that. You know what the Bible says? The Bible says that whoever God loves, he disciplines. Now, why does he discipline you? Because you're disobedient. The disobedient should always bring discipline. It's for your child's good. It's for our good that we know how to act. I thank God that we have a Bible that he's given us, that we know what he expects of us. See, you have to understand that salvation is a free gift. Nothing you can do lest any man should boast. But after that, there's some stuff that falls on us. Amen? You have to understand that once you get saved, you can't just live any way. And anybody that tells you any different, that's a lie straight from hell. Now, you can't earn salvation. You're never going to be perfect, but we have to war and fight against the flesh. Anybody that tells you that you can sin and God's just okay with it, that's not true. Otherwise, we wouldn't need to repent. But repentance is very important. Fighting against the flesh is very important. You know what it's very hard to do? Obey. We don't want to obey, right? Little babies, little kids don't want to obey. It's just in our nature. It's in that flesh. We don't want to obey. We don't want anybody to tell us what to do. We are our own person. We know better. We know what's right. And every one of us in here knows of a time in your life, and we could go on and on and on about where somebody tried to tell you to do something and you didn't want to do it, and you messed yourself up. Amen? And the same thing is true in our walk with God. We cannot as Christians walk around in direct disobedience to God and expect to be not only in his favor but we not expect him to discipline us see that's why I tell you guys a lot if you've been here if you can sin in your life and not be affected by it you're in a deep deep trouble because sin should eat you alive because when you sin the Holy Spirit convicts us because we need to deal with that sin Sin, the wages of sin are always death. Always. Sin always leads to death. Sin always leads to destruction. I don't care who you are, and we can go again. All of us have experienced that in our life. Sin always leads us away from God. God is never okay with sin. God's grace can cover sin. God's forgiveness can cover sin. But disobedience can never, ever, ever be a part of a life of a, of a disciple of God. Amen? Are you with me? Remember what we're talking about. Jesus says, if you forgive, I'll forgive. But if you don't, I won't. See, there's, there's, there's stipulations in the Word of God. There's, there's ways that we should walk. We can't just come to God with any old thing, with any old offering, just like with Cain and Abel. Now watch this. I've read the Bible, and, and you guys ever read the Bible, and you're studying the Bible, and you're like, I know I've read this before, but somehow I missed this. That's what happened to me this week. That's why it's so important that we're always in the Word of God. Every time I study the Word of God, God gives me something. Watch this. Maybe you've missed this. Too. Luke chapter 17, beginning in verse 7. Jesus says, Will any one of you who has a servant plowing or keeping sheep say to him when he has come in from the field, Come in at once and recline at my table. Will he not rather say to him, Prepare supper for me, Dress properly and serve me while I eat and drink. And afterwards, you will also eat and drink. Does he thank the servant because he did what was commanded? So you also, when you have done what you were commanded, should say, we are unworthy servants. We have only done what was our duty. Obedience to God should not be a big deal. It should be our duty. But don't all of us want a pat on the back? Don't all of us want to be recognized? Jesus is telling his disciples, when you do what I've called you to do, you're just doing your duty as a Christian. You're doing what I've asked you to do. No, no, let me rephrase that. You're doing what God has told you to do. See, we don't like those terms either. You know, it's funny to me. I'm going to come down, I'm going to meddle a little bit again. It amazes me at my job. How many people get mad when a boss tells them to go do something? They can't handle it. Well, you should have asked me. You didn't ask right. No, that's your boss, and you're getting paid. You should go do it. We can't handle that. 
And this is the generation we're raising, and this is the, the problems that we're having, and it carries over in the Word of God. See, God doesn't ask you to do anything. He doesn't have to. He's not going to beg you. He's not going to plead with you. God is God, and when He says go, we should go. Now, this is way simple, but very hard. We war against that. We fight against that. We want to make deals with God. And you guys have all seen, I mean, we live in a world where I'm telling you, I'll, I'll give you an example. We had a girl this week, just started. This past, she was there like three days. And she went to go, she left her job and went to go get a drink. And the supervisor said, you know, we really don't like you walking off your job and getting a drink. But if you're going to do that, just hurry up and go back to your job. She went home. She left. But the thing, that's, that's ludicrous, right? That's crazy. But the thing is, we do the same thing with the Word of God. Amen? We know this stuff, but I know I really shouldn't watch this, but. I know that I'm really supposed to witness and love people, but. Now, I'm talking about myself. This is where I get in trouble. This is why I always say I don't want to be a preacher. I'm a horrible Christian. I'm a hypocrite because I'm up here telling you guys this. And I'll just be honest with you. You know where this sermon really comes from? See, I've been asked to teach Sunday school, but guess what? I don't want to teach Sunday school. So now I've got a choice to make. God has called me and anointed me to teach and preach. Am I going to be obedient or not? I haven't made my mind up yet. I kind of have a feeling how it's going to go, but we'll see. See, I'm fighting against that, right? It's like where, where Jesus told Paul, it's hard to kick against the gold. It's hard to kick. You fight against that. You war against that. Let me give you a little, uh, uh, let me just help you out a little bit. It's way easier just to obey. Amen. I'm telling you guys, now I need to tell myself, but really and truly, because in the end, it's better, because guess what? And I'm not being arrogant, because this has nothing to do with me, but guess what happens if I don't teach Sunday school? This church suffers. Nothing to do with me. You know why I don't want to teach Sunday school? The same reason I don't want to preach. You know why? It's a heavy burden. Uh, Roger texts me Tuesday morning, can you preach Sunday? And you know what? My week was ruined. People would say, oh, what are you talking about? You don't understand the burden you have to carry to stand up and speak the Word of God, to teach the Word of God. It's not something we take lightly. And I've had people, I've been preaching almost 22 years, and people will say, well, one day you'll get over that. I never have, and I hope I never do. I don't ever want to just stand up and, and just kind of just pass something off as the Word of God. I don't want to do that. But it's a heavy burden. You know, I talk about if you've ever read The Pilgrim's Progress, it's this burden. And I, my week will be ruined until about... 12, 12, 15, when I get this, because that's what it is, it's like a burden off of me. And I don't know, at Sunday school, I'm like, I really don't know if I could preach every week. I, I don't know if I could do that. So you guys need to really be lifting up your pastor and your Sunday school preachers, teachers and preachers up in prayer. But if I don't do my part, guess somebody else has to. See, I, I talk all the time to Tracy about, and I'll fuss about this, and I'll fuss about that, and I'll say this, and I'll say that. And, and she's like, but are you doing your part? Because you can't control anybody else's, but are you doing your part? Obedience. Jesus says, you're, you're to say, when, when you do what you're commanded, say, we are unworthy servants. We have only done what was our duty. Now, wow. Wow. You think that'll preach today? Mm -mm. You know, we've had people leave this church. True stories. We've had people leave this church because they did something and we didn't recognize it big enough for them. First of all, you don't really want any lip service from me. It don't matter. But what does Jesus say? He says, do what you should you do. Don't let your left hand know what your right hand's doing. And what happens? You do it in secret and who rewards you? Your reward is in heaven. That's what this is saying. He's saying, after Jesus gets his, then you get yours. He says, would you not rather say to them, prepare a supper for me, dress properly and serve me while I eat and afterwards, then you will eat and drink. So you may not get any thanks in this life, but you know what you got waiting for you? Jesus. You got wait, and that's hard for us to understand because we want now. We want it now. We want it now. That's what really messed me up with preaching. When I was 17 years old, I was called to preach, and I had a little old woman talk about how that was the most prestigious thing you could ever do, how great it was, and I really thought I was something. And you know what preaching is? It's a heavy burden and a lot of work. And I don't wish it on anybody. That's the truth. It's not prestigious. That's why when people say, I want to be a Sunday school teacher, I'm like, I don't think you know what you're talking about. Or I've known people that say, I really want to be a deacon. I really don't think you do. 
Because if you understood what that meant, you wouldn't want it. You understand what I'm saying? Now, I'm not saying you wouldn't do it, but really and truly, I've had people say to me, a pastor shouldn't get paid. I'm like, you couldn't double my salary what I make now at work and ask me to be a pastor. It's not worth it because you don't understand what you're talking about. There's no amount of money you can pay a pastor and it ever be worth what he has to do because it's not about that. But in the end, you have to be obedient. And in the end, it's like the Bible says, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. But it's better for all of us if we do it now, if we obey. You know, if you go to the book of Revelation, I want to show you what, what this looks like, what obedience looks like. The book of Revelation, chapter 2, Jesus says this to the church of Ephesus. He says, These things I say to he who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the seven golden, laps, golden lampstands. I know your works, your labor, your patience, that you cannot bear those who are evil and that you have tested those who say they are apostles and are not, and have found them to be liars. And you have persevered and have patience and have labored for my name's sake and have not become weary. weary. Nevertheless, I have this against you. You have left your first love. What is that love? This is what Jesus says in John chapter 14, beginning in verse 15. He says, if you love me, keep my commands. See, we all say, oh yeah, I love God. Well, Jesus says, if you love me, you'll obey me. Let me tell you something, young people. If you love your parents, you'll obey them. Now, a lot of times we do stuff just out of duty, but really and truly, if you love your parents and your parents have what's best for you at heart, and I promise you, they do, you'll obey them. And God has what's best. Whatever God has, it's perfect. Amen? Amen? God's will is perfect. Even if God's will is a cross and a miserable death, that's his perfect will. And if you love him, you'll obey him. What does it mean to love Jesus? Jesus says, no one can be my disciple. Now listen, this is the word of God. No one can be my disciple unless they deny their self, take up their cross daily, and follow me. Where is that? What is Jesus? Where are we going? To obedience of the Father. That's what he says. I have my food to do. That's when they asked him, has he already ate? When they went to get him food, he says, my food is to do the will of him who sent me. If you love Jesus, you'll obey him. Obey him to what? To the cross. What does that mean? It means die to yourself. See, we skip across Jesus. Jesus didn't have to go to the cross. You say, oh, yes, he did. No, he didn't. He chose to go to the cross. Jesus made a choice to go to the cross. Was it easy? Absolutely not. Was he earnest in his prayer in the garden that this past could come from me, could pass from me? You better believe he meant that prayer. He didn't have to go to the cross. He could have said no to the Father, but he would have been disobedient, and not only would he have suffered, see, we don't understand that, but the whole world would have suffered from that act of disobedience. The whole world is suffering now from one act of disobedience. What was it? The garden. Disobedience, sin, the wages of sin are always death. Jesus made a choice. That's what he said. Nobody takes my life. I lay it down. Was it easy? No. Did Jesus physically feel every pain inflicted? Every Yes. We, we missed that, that yes, he was God, but yes, he was man. And yes, he chose to go to the cross. Obedience is a choice. Obedience is a choice. Jesus says, if you love me, you'll obey me. In verse 21, he says, whoever has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me. In verse 24, he says, and anyone who does not love, anyone who does not love me, will not obey my commands. So anytime that you say, I know I shouldn't do this, but what you're doing is disobeying God. Not me. Like, I'm not your pastor. I'm just some fill-in preacher, goofball. It don't matter to me. But you know what? You can fool your pastor. It don't really matter. Because you know what? The pastor doesn't hold in his hand the power of your life and your death. He cannot send your soul 
to hell. That's what Jesus, the Bible tells us, not to fear the one that can just kill us, but what? To fear the one that can, and we don't have that fear of God. Amen? Really and truly, if we feared God, we would obey him. Amen? Because I'm telling you, some of you grew up like I did. My mom, I believed with all my heart, would kill me. I believed it. Like my mom, like, you did not cross my mom. Like, I mean, I grew up with one of those parents. Like, she she wring your jaws. Like, you know what I'm talking about? Like, and if we really truly believed, but see, God's grace is so powerful and his love is so powerful, we take it, for, oh, we take it for granted. We rub it in his face. Really, truly. There's no fear of God. The Bible says the fear of God is the beginning of all wisdom. We don't have that. Now, maybe if God started ringing some bells, amen, but he does discipline us. We should be thankful that he's not striking us because we would all be dead, right? The wages of sin, we would all be dead. But we take it so, so lightly. Because why? Because we're taught that we can do whatever we want and God loves us just like Santa Claus and he's making a list and checking it twice, but nobody really gets coal for Christmas. Amen? Everybody really gets present. That's what we teach. That's what we believe of God. Everybody's going to go to heaven. He understands you know just do the best you can and that's not what the bible says the bible says if you love me you'll obey me now why is this so important because i don't know about you but i struggle live in this world anybody else like i, I like i'm not kidding like every day i, don't, I can't un understate like every day i wake up i'm like how in the world i don't know how to live in this world I just, I don't know. Like every day I wake up, I'm like, what's it going to be today? It's like the twilight zone, right? It's like, what's it going to be today? I mean, it's so evil and so just horrible. Like the things that are going on in this world. And, and if we're not careful, if I'm not careful, what happens is, what, I, what happens to me is, is I get uh, really jaded and really cold. And see, that's what the Bible says. The Bible says in the last days, the love of many will grow cold. And you, you kind of become indifferent, amen? You kind of become, you know, I heard, I was watching a video last night, and I heard somebody say, if in January three years ago, somebody would have told you that we were going to go through what we're about to go through, and I'm like, that math don't work. Three years ago, it's like, wow, three years, 2020 is three years ago. I, don't, I mean, like, and, and think about where we're at today. And you're like, you know, I know I'm like, Roger, you know, we're like, we all get tired of hearing it. Right? We get tired of watching the news. We get tired of reading Revelation because you're like, okay, you're telling me it's going to get worse? So if we're not real careful, we, we lose our focus, or I do. We, lo we lose our purpose. We lose, it's like, what's the point? And if I'm honest with you, I don't even want to preach because that's what I tell Tracy, and she's like, you better bite your tongue. But I'm like, what's the point? Like, if we're not careful, we get this mindset where all this stuff is going to happen. So what's the point? It doesn't matter anyway. Like, the will of God is going to happen, right? You read Revelation, these things have to happen. It's in the Word of God. All these things, there's, there's going to be more diseases, there's going to be earthquakes, there's going to be war. I mean, you start talking about the millions and millions of people that are going to die. You start talking about all this stuff. You start talking about the mark of the beast, and you're like, la, 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 right? You don't want to hear it. All these things are going to happen. So we have a choice to make. And what is the choice? We can be obedient to God or we can just let it just take us with it. Because you're going you're gonna, to, one way or the other, you're going to have to make a stand. You're going to have to make a decision. And so what I want to show you today in the Word of God is how do you do that? What does it look like to be obedient to God? And this is really simple, but it's really hard. Well, we'll get there in a second. We're talking about obedience. Now, I'm going to leave you with something, a phrase. And if you don't remember anything else about this whole sermon, I want you to remember this pattern that you're going to see in the Word of God. I'm going to show you one phrase. And I want you to remember this one phrase, because this one phrase makes all the difference in the world, because all these things are going to happen. And it's hard sometimes, right? It's hard to even pray if we're honest, like, because if we're not careful, we get in this, or I do, I get in this mindset, well, all these things are going to happen anyway, so what's the point of even praying, right? Like, and you even think about, like, am I praying against the will of God? Am I, am I, all these things are going to happen, so if we're not, real, and that's what I do, if I'm not real careful, I say, well, what's the point? You know, it, it, all this stuff's going to happen, it's just going to get worse. 
So I want to show you something in the Word of God. If you want to go with me, I'm going to show you three places. They're all real close together. You don't have to do a lot of flipping. We're going to go to 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, and Titus. All three right in a row. So Paul is teaching Timothy and Titus how to set up a church. They're, they're church leaders and if you go through the first, it talks about, you know, we see the qualifications of deacons and things like that, overseers. And what Paul's doing, he's laying the groundwork, because that's what Paul was sent to do, to build the church. And that's where we're at right here. He's building the church. But all this carries over today to the church, to us today. So Paul, through the Holy Spirit, speaking to Timothy, and now the Word of God through the Holy Spirit, speaking to us today. So, 1 Timothy chapter 6, let's begin in verse 3. It says, If anyone teaches a different doctrine and does not agree with the sound words of our Lord Jesus Christ and the teaching that accords with godliness, he is puffed up with conceit and understands nothing. He, is un he has an unhealthy craving for controversy and for quarrels and about words which produce envy, dissension, slander, evil suspicions, and constant friction among the people who are depraved in mind and deprived of the truth imagining that godliness is a means of gain but excuse me but godliness with contentment is great gain for we brought nothing into the world and we can take nothing out of it but if we have food and clothing with these things we shall be content but those who desire to be rich fall into temptation into a snare into the many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction and you know verse 10 for the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil and it is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with the pangs but here's the verse if you write in your bible i want you to underline it highlight it, it's highlighted in my bible i know pastor don't like that but i'll write mark in mind but as for you see that's the key there's always going to be lovers of money. There's always going to be false teachers. There's always going to be these things. These things are going to happen. But Paul says, but as for you, but as for you, O man of God, flee these things. Pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, steadfastness, gentleness. Fight the good fight of faith. So all these things are going to happen, but they don't have to happen in your life. People are going to grow cold. The love of many is going to grow cold, but it doesn't have to be you. And even I'll go so far as to say you can improve your health now to help you when these sicknesses come. It doesn't have to be you. All these things, lovers of money. If that, that's, that, I'm telling you, everything today, at right, everybody has to have a side hustle, amen? Everybody has a side hustle. Everybody's selling something. And I'm not saying we don't need money. That's not what I'm saying. But the Bible says that we should not, that shouldn't be our, our, our focus shouldn't be on money, but we should be content with what we have. But as for you, now go over to uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3. Now watch this. This is us right here. 2 Timothy chapter 3. But understand this, that in the last days there will come times of difficulty. Now watch this. See if this don't match up with today. For people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unappeasable, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not loving good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having the appearance of godliness, but denying its power, avoid such people. And if you drop down to verse 10, it says, You, however, have followed my teaching, my conduct, my aim of life, my faith, my patience, my love, my steadfastness, steadfastness my persecutions, and my suffering. And then in verse 14 it says, But as for you, see all these things are going to happen. And that list, does that not sound like today? And if we're not real careful, does that not sound like me? If I'm not real careful and fighting against the world, that list, I'd, all those things, now I'm not disobedient to my parents anymore, but all these things. But see, all these things happen, it's in the Word of God. It's going to happen. You're seeing it today. It's unfolding in front of you. All these things. But as for you, it doesn't have to happen in your heart. It doesn't have to happen in your home. It doesn't have to happen in this church. And that's how we build a nation, right? Because it starts with one person. It starts in the home. Then you go and it branches out. All these things, all these things that are going to have to happen, they're going to happen. Prophecy says, the Bible says it's going to happen. But as for you. Because here's the thing. 
I'm going to talk to the wives for just a minute. I'm going to make things easy for you if you haven't been married very long. You cannot control your husband. Amen? You can't. Husbands can't control your wives. See, really and truly, we know what's fixing to happen, what I'm fixing to say, but it's the truth, but we don't live that way. The only person I can control is me. See, that's why it's hard to preach. I can't control you guys. I can't make you guys believe this. I can't make you guys change your life. I can't do any of that, but I have to be obedient to God to preach his word. It's not on me, but now it's on you. The only person you can control is yourself. But as for you, all these things are going to happen. You're going to see all this disobedience. You're going to see all this false doctrine, all this false gospels. You're seeing it today. Lovers of money, lovers of self, me, 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 disobedient, but as for you, how are you going to live? Now, I'm not saying we shouldn't instruct each other. We're talking about church discipline, right? I've been called to preach you. And that's why I don't want to preach because you know what? I'm going to be next week when I tell Ann I don't want to be a Sunday school teacher, a big hypocrite. Amen? That's why I don't want to preach. That's why I don't want to teach. It's a heavy burden. And guess what the Bible says? I'll face stricter judgment than you guys because I'm doing that. So I have to make sure it's on myself. It's not easy. It's hard to be obedient. I can't control you. I sure can't control my wife. If you've ever met her, you know that's true. But it's not my job to control her. But you know what she tells me all the time? Michael, you can cut this part out because she's right and I don't want her to know it. My disobedience affects her. See, we're one. We're one flesh. Your disobedience affects your household. If you're not obedient to God, it affects the people around you. Not only because God's going to discipline me, and guess that's what's going to do to my household, but just because you're a leader, whether you like it or not, and I don't like that word. I don't like to be a leader, but I'm a leader. People look at me, and that's why it bothers me. I'm always like, I don't even want to tell people I'm a Christian because I'm a horrible Christian. Because I'm disobedient to the Word of God. You know what? Those two things should never go together. Is it possible for a Christian to be disobedient to the Word of God? You know what's amazing? One thing that stuck with, with me again about Pastor Moses, somebody asked Pastor Moses one time, can a Christian sin? And I'm like, well, I do it every day. And he paused for a minute and he said, yeah, but it would be very hard. It would be very hard for a Christian to sin. See, we don't believe that. We don't have the same gospel. We've walked the gospel down. You can sin. You can do whatever you want. God's forgiven you. It's fine. That's not the truth of God's word. Obedience. If you go back to look at King Saul, if you remember what, what the prophet said to King Saul, obedience is better than sacrifice. Saul was doing what he probably genuinely believed was a good thing, sacrificing these animals to the Lord. But he disobeyed God because God said, kill them all and don't bring any back. So even in his intentions, he thought he was doing something good. Moses struck the rock. Disobedience. Disobedience. Sin. Disobedience is sin, and the wages of sin is always death. One more time, Paul says this to Titus. In Titus chapter 1, beginning in verse 10, it says, For there will be many insubordinate, empty talkers and deceivers, especially those of the circumcision party. They must be silent since they are upsetting whole families by teaching for shameful gain what they ought not to teach. One of the Cretans, a prophet of their own, said, Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, and lazy gluttons. This is a tes true testimony. Therefore rebuke them sharply that they may be sound in the faith, not devoting themselves to Jewish myths and commands of people who turn away from the truth. To the pure all things are pure, but to the defiled and the unbelieving nothing is pure. But their minds and their conscience are defiled. They profess to know God, but deny Him in their works. They are detestable, disobedient, unfit for any good work. But as for you, teach sound doctrine. See, especially in the church, like one thing I've did, and the pastor's not here, one thing, the worst thing you could ever do is start studying these false doctrines. It breaks your heart. It kills me. I don't do it anymore. And Tracy will be like listening to a song or listening to a preacher and she'll be like, don't tell me, I don't want to hear it. Because if you know the stuff these people teach, it's detestable. It breaks my heart. You know, I lay awake at night. This is the God's honest truth. I, weigh, uh, I lay awake at night repenting for the things that have been done in the name of God. Like, 
you, you ever watch like the documentaries about Jim Jones? That kills me. That people, in the name of God. But as for you, see, I can't change that. I, I can't change Dole Osteen and Joyce Meyer. I can't change Kenneth Copeland and these crazy people. I can't change them. But as for me, see, that's why I don't like preaching, but I hope it's never easy. Because I only want to preach the truth. And one thing about it, if you ever want your prayer life to increase, you want to be better at praying, sign up to teach a class. Become a preacher. It, it, I'm telling you, I'm, I am a better person. I'm a better prayer. I'm a better husband when I have to preach. And that's sad because it drives you to your knees. Disobedience is never, ever, ever okay. But as for you, how are you going to live? And understand, there's a price to be paid. Either way, there's a price to be paid. Disobedience to God or obedience to God. There's a price to pay. And there's coming a time in this world where obedience to Christ is going to be a heavier price than it is now. But the Bible says, if you deny me, my Father will deny you. I'll deny you to my Father, right? Like, you can't, you know, we, we see these things. Let me explain something to you. I know I'm past 12, but let me explain something to you real quick. I want you to know this is, this is of the utmost importance. Right now, today, in 2023, as we speak, somebody is making a decision for Christ that's going to cost them their life. Today, in this world. It's not you or me. Somebody today, in this world, is choosing to serve Christ, and it will cost them their physical life. They will be killed for it. It's not you or me. But maybe it will. But if we're not careful in our slack disobedience, what we're going to do is we're going to say, well, I'll just be a secret Christian. Or, or if, you know, if somebody put a gun to your head and said, all you have to do is denounce Christ and I'll let you live. In our mind, if we're not careful, we might say, well, I'll just trick them, but God really knows my heart. Or I'll repent for it later. I don't know if that's going to work. Because if we don't have it in us now, if we're not obedient to God now, and I know these are extremes and we don't understand it, and I pray to God we never will, but if the Lord tarries or we don't go by the grave, there's going to come a time in this nation where we see those things. All over the world, we lose sight of that as American Christians. We are spoiled rotten. All over the world, our brothers and sisters right now will be raped, tortured, and murdered for obedience to God. So you better make it up in your mind today while we've got it good that you're going to obey. Now, I know it's easy for us to say, oh, I would never. You'd be surprised. You would be surprised what you would do to save your child, to save your spouse, to save another child. You would be surprised what you would do. I'm going to leave you with one last verse. Joshua chapter 24, beginning in verse 14. Now therefore fear the Lord and serve Him in sincerity and in faithfulness. Put away the gods your father served beyond the river and in Egypt and serve the Lord. And if it is evil in your eyes to serve the Lord, choose this day whom you will serve, whether the gods your father served in the region beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. It's your choice. See, the good and the bad of it is God could make you, but He doesn't. Now, I don't know about you, but sometimes I'm like, I wish God would just take my free will and just take it away from me. I wish I didn't have a choice. You know, like, but He does. He gives you a choice. It's your choice. Every day you've got to make up in your mind, purpose in your heart, maybe even minute by minute, I'm going to deny myself, take up my cross, and follow Him. Obedience is always the best path.